Good afternoon, goons. Welcome back to another episode of Jack of All Trades. Here, as always, with Kaylin and my producer Sam, and I am David. So I figure today we're gonna we've been talking about trading a little bit, um, and we should um, we're gonna touch on a little bit of investing first, and then talk about trading after and trading styles. Um, right now, I'm gonna cover a stock that I'm really into that I called a few years ago, um, which is um, uh, Xpeng, uh, one of the new EV communities from China, and. I did a comparison here last uh, October against Neo because Neo was like, I guess Neo, Neo and Xpeng were like the two major players that came out of China in the last few years, and there's a lot of comparisons between the two. And it seems like Neo had a lot of hype coming out. It was a little bit older, had more products out, out, and I was like alone when I picked Xpeng to be the one that came out um, that's going to come out on top. And over time, this was September two thousand and one, two thousand August two two thousand twenty actually. Until now, it's been the trajectory has been completely different, and it's been exactly what I called. And this is a pure fundamental analysis; it's not technicals at all. So I'm just the charts just here for for reference and seeing how the price action kind of reacted to the performance over time. But um, if you can see the chart here, when they first started out, uh, it was Q2 2020. Xpeng's income was negative two million, two point two, two point three million, while Neo's was forty four million. Not their profit, but this is their revenue, right? So Xpeng was losing money uh, badly. There was a 6.5x difference between the two of them going into Q3, 13 million versus 84 million. But once I started digging into the financials, um, I started noticing a difference where their, where Neo was, uh, Xpeng was closing the gap. So uh, the, the following quarter, that gap became 5.5, following quarter, 4.7, 3.5, and so on. And you see now the difference is not very stark at all. So the most, I think this was the end of the year, uh, the full year 2021. Uh, Neo's revenue was 3.25 billion. Or sorry, Xpeng's revenue was 3.25 billion. Neo's was 5.6. So within the span of just under two years, they closed the gap from a 6.5x difference to a 2x difference, or less than a 2x difference, actually. And that's amazing. And they've kept their kind of costs uh, in check, too, because 2019, they were losing 500 million. 2021, they're, you know, increased their sales significantly, but they're still only losing about 750 million. Whereas Neo's got losing a 1.6 billion. Like they're, like they, they, they're, they're losing quite a bit of money each quarter. And yeah, I just, um, I was looking at their fundamentals and I was like, if you, if you even track this number real quick, gross profit, right? Neo's looking good. It's been, it's been improving its numbers, but x is better. Now it's, it wasn't just, but it, but it wasn't just fundamental analysis though. Like I actually, you have to actually kind of look into their business model a little bit. Like Xpeng had one thing that I thought was super important that almost no one was ever talking about, which was their price point. Um, everybody has this idea that EVs are expensive and Xpeng was addressing a market that's like just below, well, it's definitely like half the cost. They're basically half to a third of the cost of a Tesla and they're cheaper than Neo, but at least looking at the functions of the car and their advertising that you're not losing a whole lot in terms of performance or, or anything like that. So I'm like, if they're selling a cheaper product, that's not going to lose too much in terms of performance, then they're going to, they should, the market should react very favorably to them. Right. I don't know what your thoughts are on, on that, Caitlin. Yeah. I was just going to kind of ask you like, what's the, cause I know you're obviously correlating the two and Tesla obviously kind of falls into the same sort of category. How often do you do that? Just, like compare two companies together like is that a big part of your process like if if like if if you know xpeng just existed by itself or if there was you know three or four different manufacturers kind of in the same line would you be comparing all of them to kind of look at like the top one to pick or would you more so just look into them individually and kind of go that route and then just use this as sort of like a backup comparison that's a really good question actually um i never thought about it but Thinking about it now, I, I actually start with just the company first, kind of kind of independent of the market or the competitors, because usually there's no point in looking at the whole market of the company itself sucks. So then I'll start with the company. I'll look at and I'll, I'll, I'll look, this is exactly the first line I'll look at. I'm like, is it trending up? Are these things trending up? Is the revenue trending up? Is the cost of goods sold? Uh, the cost is it is it being maintained? Um, operating revenue, like all these things, I'm looking at it. And if it's generally trending up, then I'm like, okay, this is um, at least worth looking into a little bit more. And then if it's in like, if it's in like an established market, um, like a fuel cars, then yeah, I'll compare them to uh, the main competitors, like the big, the big dogs in the industry. Um, at the time I was looking at Xpeng, it was just Tesla and it was not, 
like I can compare it to Tesla, but I don't think it would tell me very much. Um, because Tesla is kind of like, because of what I know about Tesla, they're doing so much that's unique that it's like, it's just, you're not going to get too much information comparing them to Tesla. You should just kind of, kind of look at them independently as a company saying, well, can they hang out? Can they hang, uh, on their own? Can they, can they grab market share on their own? The reason I was comparing it to Neo was like, cause they're both, uh, companies from China. And so I'm, I'm very big on, the, on political plays. And so like if the, in, in, in any industry, if the company, um, if the industry you're in is backed by the government, then you have almost, um, an unfair advantage, right? So like, um, LG and, uh, TC, TSMC, two of Taiwan's champions, they're champions because the, the government backs them, you know, they give them, you know, interest-free loans, they'll, they'll do a lot of stuff for them. Um, same thing with Samsung and all the Korean companies, Hyundai, Kia, they have an unfair advantage. So then I like and it, it doesn't happen in the West either, which sucks. But so when I saw these two, I was like, okay, they're China champions. And so they're going to have um, basically an unfair advantage. And you see this like happen pretty often. Like Neo just, or sorry, X-Bank just got a, um, I think it was a one point something billion line of credit from their local province, uh, Wuhan, <laughs> ironically. <laughs> I, think, <laughs> I, think, I think they're trying to like, you know, trying to bring back industry. So they're like, we'll give you like one point something billion to build a factory in, in here. So then... Right. So like, those are the kind of things that, that that's like, that's like, that's like tailwinds. It's like really helps a company out. And, and that's why, like, I, I looked at these companies. I don't look at the Koreans and I don't, I won't look at any American companies. Like I, I need it. I need the company to have an edge. And so like when they have an edge like that, I don't really, I don't really count the, the whole market as much. I kind of discount like, you know, where they are against Tesla. I'm like, yeah. Like, actually, no, Tesla's different. I would say, like, I, comparing them to, like, a GM or whatever, I'm like, GM's just outgunned. I'm sorry. But but the U.S. is not really helping their their local companies, so. But, yeah. So, but like, yeah. If, you were to look at, if you were to look at, like, say, Neo by itself, would you consider that a good investment or or still no? So that's, yeah. So um, if Xpeng didn't exist, I would consider neo right. a pretty decent um investment but because um x-pain existed i'm like okay now i have to look deep there's actually a third one it's called lee auto um but i kind of dismissed them because i i, I looked at the financials the same way they're just not as strong they're like the kind of the third me too company mm -hmm. um so out of the three x was my pick and it was because um there, back then like i was around like 20 to uh, 2020 period so like there's not much financials to go by um in terms of sales like i think they only did like maybe twenty thousand units that year so like what i looked at was their business model and that's what sold me on uh, x-pain versus neo so 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 x-pain's business model is let's make a product that's like a third of the cost of a tesla with marketing as slick as tesla and we don't lose we're not going to lose too much in performance um it's they're just they're 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 See, what, their, their pedigree is what I looked at first. Um, their management came from the cell phone market. And their investor, their huge investors are um, Alibaba and the Sequoia. And so, like, these guys have a, a cell phone pedigree. And so their, their, their business model is basically, like, let's sell a phone at break even or even at a loss. Because the whole point is to get units out there. And then we can sell them software and everything like that um, later on. So they just they only care about grabbing market share. So... That's why they they have the strategy of selling um, an EV at a like, low cost. They actually just announced a twenty five thousand dollar EV in China only, but twenty five thousand dollar US EV uh, heading towards the China market. Really? Like, yeah, like they're gonna they're really shaking it up, and they've nice. built. Yeah, you're interested in one, right? <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> yeah, at nice. twenty five thousand, even if the range is not that crazy, like come on, it's like at, with today's oil prices, like I'll make it work, you know. <laughs> Yeah, well, what's the cheapest one that we have here is like what maybe around oh. fifty thousand brand new Canadian. So I don't know, call yeah. it forty two thousand US, something like that. Yeah, yeah, it's a huge difference. Because yeah. I keep so, looking around you know, because you know, I've had my sign on order now for like years. So <laughs> who knows? Next year, I think I think they're gonna yeah. um, start delivering at the end of this year, and then if they ramp up correctly by next year, I think they might do something like a hundred thousand units a year. So, are they finalizing the prices yet? Do you know? No, I think they can't until the inflation and all that stuff kind of settles down. Because right now they have that like 
yeah they have like material contracts that they're signing new ones and the old ones are expiring and then so it's like there's so much up in the air i don't think they have a, a, any clue like what what it would cost maybe even six months from now right. but um yeah. but yeah as far as neil's yeah. concerned like um yeah i just have one more thing to say about neil which was the the deal breaker for me so Okay. okay it's it's like okay like they 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 price a card near tesla they want to fight tesla i'm like okay that's stupid but you go ahead you know maybe maybe it'll work because you have the local support or whatever it is right but the one thing that they did stupid was they're doing a battery swap um infrastructure where it's like you could it's risky it could work in one way but it's i don't think it will it's like so you could buy a sixty thousand dollar car uh, suv from them or you could buy the same car for fifty thousand dollars and then lease the battery it's like 200 bucks or you know 50 bucks a month or 200 bucks it was something like it's an r&b so i don't know how to calculate it but um but yeah so like so basically you could so you could buy the car and then lease the battery and then so i thought that was an interesting business model but what happens with the lease battery is um you can swap it they, so they're building battery swap stations in cities right now so you can just drive in and then it'll kind of like pop out the battery from the bottom uh, and pop out a new one in the, uh, and then you're, you're gone so it's like kind of like they're trying to solve the um the charge time issue but if you actually think about so i looked into how that worked and it's pretty stupid because like so i can charge from like 20 percent to 80 percent of my tesla in about 30 minutes if you do a battery swap station they say the swap takes like three minutes like, yeah but you actually have to wait you know for what because it's only one car at a time so if you actually like go there when it's busy by the time you're out it takes you 20 20 minutes anyway so what are you going to do you're really saving 10 minutes out of your day like that's that's an insignificant difference right Meanwhile, they can't guarantee that the battery, like, so let, let's say you bought a brand new Neo, brand new battery, you swap it. How do you know you're getting a battery that's just as good? Like that hasn't been run down for like, you know, this, there's just like so many questions. And on top of that, it's like, it's just like capital intensive heavy. Like you could see, like, you could see how much it's costing them. Cost of goods sold, it's like $4 billion off. Like, you know, it's because like they have to keep building those swap stations. The more cars they sell, they have the more swap stations they have to build. And it's just like, it's an added cost. Like, why would you? You're a startup. What if you run out of money? Yeah, more employees, more hydro, more gas for to run all these extra buildings. All that stuff just keeps going up. Yeah, not to mention, I don't, I don't know how what their leasing structure is for the land. Like, they're gonna be on land in China of, of all places, right? So it's like, how much is that costing you to lease? Well, even it, so, I mean, like, if you look at where like Tesla charger stations and all these other charging stations are, like, most of them we're in malls and grocery stores and stuff anyway so it's like it's easy enough you literally just drive into the grocery store plug, plug your car in go shopping come out and it's charged good to go for another however many days yeah i think um tesla was super smart in building that out early when people kind of dismissed evs and dismissed how big the market is because the, <laughs> they actually got a lot of the land for free like they don't actually pay for a lot of um their the land uh where they built the superchargers on because the idea because you know the persistent idea is like people who drive teslas are rich and then so it's like if you want rich people to park your car in your in your business then you'd want some chargers near your business so then they actually yeah. got in a fair deal <laughs> yeah. it's like how Especially clever is that right now, because yeah yeah well even more so right because the more that more people drive electric cars the more it's going to be like okay you know say this grocery store has charging stations and this one doesn't but i drive an electric electric I was an electric guitar electric <laughs> electric car so you, know, you just go to the go to the one that has a charging station so you're basically guaranteeing yourself more business yeah 100 percent. so i'm going to unshare my screen right now because i know you have some talk to talk about with the uh the trades but yeah man so, so like I gonna... sorry so, is that what you gonna say? oh i was just gonna so... say like the thing is like the kind of like the cat's out of the bag now i think um landowners are seeing that EV, EV space for chargers are in demand. So I don't think, so I think Tesla kind of closed the door behind them where it's like, they got a nice deal, but then everybody else is going to get fucked. Like if you, like if GM wanted a piece of a mall, they'd be like, yeah, the lease is 1500 a month, a month or whatever. Yeah, that'd be a little excessive. Okay. Um, What's I interesting though, into... I found out, sorry, just one more thing. I found out something that's really interesting that's happening in Europe. There's an oil company. I I don't. I want to say Shell, but I'm not sure if it's them. It's it, there is an oil company that has um, um that's that has been building EV uh, pure EV uh, refill stations, not not oil uh, refill stations. Oh yeah, so like they're just they only take like EV vehicles. Yep. And I noticed that the Sunoco by my house, they have a, a fast charger there. You, you pay for it obviously, but it's it's interesting. You have like six stalls of fuel, and you have one stall for electric. 
that's kind of cool we're gonna have to start doing that though i mean like most yeah. like just there's enough places now that are saying you know by 2030 or whatever 2035 like we're not selling gas vehicles anymore so yeah yeah have to become more. um yeah so i think i'm gonna look at the imx here um if that's cool with you just because this is a little bit more in, in my world <laughs> were you talking about this earlier in the week uh i think so yeah i traded this one so i just kind of wanted to go through it and uh mm -hmm. and basically talk about like how how i kind of um uh, basically like kind of what, wh where I'm at right now in my trading career, essentially. And like, um, I know we talk a lot about how you trade versus how I trade and like, you know, you're, you're always like, for the most part, one in one out, right? Like you want to just like <laughs> bottom ticket, top ticket and that's it. Right. You don't want to, you don't want to scale yeah. in and out. So like, I'm kind of like, I, I like to scale, but I'm kind of at a point now where like, I don't know, I, I'm trying to figure out like what the best way to make money is now. Cause like I have a system, like my system, System works like it works really well for making money and stuff like that now i'm you know you kind of work your way and it's like how do i optimize it right like how do i make more money using the same system so um i'm not going to go over like a ton of the background stuff here just because like if you guys want to know how i trade and stuff you can watch a bunch of our other videos but just to kind of keep this short and sweet um obviously the, these, these are the daily candles here so we had you know over the past like couple weeks um we were down here at like a dollar 32 on this stock it's just you know just one of your generally shitty pharmaceutical companies so always good to short <laughs> but uh we had you know three like two days here where it kind of ripped up from a dollar 30 up to almost three bucks um tanked and then it kind of ran up again and then it tanked again so um big picture here i'll just uh, draw some lines and just so we can see like obviously these are kind of your prior tops um in this area here so that that was the first area that i was looking for was up kind of near this level here and you know up into the obviously into the whole dollar mark then three so and then next move basically was going to be up into kind of roughly this sort of area here which is all these bottoms from here and these tops um from back like you know in december 2021 uh so those were the those are the main levels that i could see on this stock now i i know basically from all my you know experience and and just my setups and stuff like that i know that when i see this sort of a candle a lot of the times you'll get kind of this slow bounce and then you'll get a reject up past this prior high and then that's when like it'll have a big sell off so basically like there's 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 a couple different ways that you can play right like you can either um say you're trying to play this move here right you're trying to play this this secondary move and then get the wash back down to you know 185 or whatever it is you could either go in full size and then cover out full size or you can scale into this bounce and then scale out of the bounce. So I wanted to kind of talk about that because a lot, like a lot of these ones as well, you have to pay for locates because they're like they're hard to borrow stocks. So in a lot of the cases, you know, like this thing could be, you know, anywhere from a couple pennies to, you know, 10, 15 cents a share that you have to pay for to locate it if you want to short. And you have to pay for that. And then whether you use, you use the shares or not, then, you know, you, you still have to pay that fee. So if you want to locate, say, a thousand shares and it's, say, 10 cents a share, you got to pay a hundred bucks. And then if you don't get your entry, then you're just you just lost a hundred bucks essentially on that trade. Right. Because you can't get that money back. So that's kind of where it comes in. Like, do you want to be you know, do you want to scale in and out of trades or do you want to go? in and out full size and like this is something that i'm playing around with this right now myself like i'm playing around with scaling in and then going full size um, on the downturn or just waiting and only going full size so the way that i play right now is i'll basically locate um enough to kind of scale my range first and then once i see the turn depending on what the prices the locates are and what my target is I'll locate more and then I'll, I'll, you know, carry down for the wash. So like, let's just say, for example, you know, you're using a thousand shares just to keep things easy for me. Um, I'd be looking at, uh, I'd be looking at essentially, um, let me just see, I can draw something in here. Did this company just IPO? There's no history before December. Yeah. Oh God. Wait in here. Yeah. I think they did. It's not very old. Um, but yeah, so like basically like for me to scale this, what I'd be looking for is, you know, right here. Um, you know, I'd be looking for the top of this wick, like the, or sorry, the open of this candle. I'd be looking for 
the top of this wick here. Sorry, I'm not very good with this fucking thing here. I'd be looking for the top of that wick. And then I'd be looking for basically up towards this next line. So essentially, like the way that I trade most of the time right now is I would scale through these levels. So let's just say, you know, I was going to use a thousand shares just for argument's sake. I would do maybe, you know, 150 or so at each one of these levels or 100 or 200 or whatever you want. And that's the amount I would locate first. So like I'd pay for, let's just say I'd pay for 300 shares. I'd go, you know, 100 here, 100 here, and then 100 up here. And then once I see the thing really turn around, I'd, I'd locate the other 700 and then I'd put it on, you know, say over here or something like that, right? So the nice thing about that is it gives you a little bit more flexibility because obviously, you know, let's say the stock only pops to your line here at 250 and then it tanks, then, okay, well, at least I got some, some of a position on, right? I, I made a little bit of money or if it gets up, you know, to this one, and then it just tanks and you don't really have an opportunity to add into it. At least I made some money, right? Like it's essentially these, these entries here really are just almost to pay for your locates. Like you're not really going to make a whole ton of money on them. So trading, like when you're scaling into stuff and scaling out of stuff, if that's, if you're not adding in full size after you're, you're really just going to be like making smaller amounts of money on every trade. And so it takes more, more trades to make a lot of money. Whereas if you just go in, like you could just wait and go in full size and then, you know, take a shorter amount of the move and then potentially in theory, make more money. But then the problem arises. It's like, okay, well, what if it doesn't go up that high? Like, what if you're saying, okay, I need to see it get up to 360 and reject. And then once I see the rejection, which we see here, you know, that big top wick off the three, you know, we hit 350 basically, but you know, 350, 360 line see that rejection and then we get below this prior candle high here when we open the next day it's like okay that's my signal to go in full size and maybe risk just over three bucks so i can get full size here you know 285 risk 15 cents and then maybe my target's down here at the bottom where it bounced last time at a dollar 90 right so you can risk 15 cents to make basically a dollar like that's a you know great risk reward but on the flip side what if you know, if you're doing the scaling version of that, okay, I got some here at 250, I got some more here at 290. Um, you know, maybe I did or didn't get this up here. Let's just say I did for argument's sake. I got some up here at 350. It comes down. I can take some off right here at 280, and now I've basically paid for my locates. And then as it, you know, as it bounces, you can look in the smaller time frames and sort of trade in and out of these bounces as you're as you're working your way down with smaller size, but the problem with that is that you you have to do that. Like it's a very, very active style of trading. You have to be really involved because you're like, you know, in, out, in, out, in, out, in, out all the time, because that's the only way that you're going to be able to make your money. Cause you're not making, you're not making as much per share, but if you go all in, all out, you're always risking more on each of your trades. You're probably going to trade less often, but when you get the payout, it's going to be a bigger payout. So like in this example here, you know, if I was planning to scale the range from 250 to 350, basically, I mean, if I got my three entries here and it comes down and, you know, I added more here at 285, I'm still risking up essentially over this top wick here. So like if it bounces up to, you know, 320 and then it starts to turn around, then I can add a little bit more. So I'm not going to stop out in that situation, but I'm trading much smaller size so I can account for that range. Whereas if I just didn't do any of these original scales, got in over here and then this popped to, you know, 305, well, I've just taken, you know, I've just taken a 20 cent loss on full size. And then if it turns around again, maybe I try and get back in and then it, and then it kind of bounces again and I take another loss. And then, you know, eventually it kind of turns around and there's there's guys I know that trade like that too. So like that's when you kind of work on like your risk reward ratio. So like you might hear guys on Instagram or Twitter or whatever saying like, you know, I only trade a, a, a 1.5 R or better, a 2 R or better. And it's like a risk reward ratio. So like I'm not going to take the trade unless I know, you know, based on whatever your your uh, history of studying this pattern is that I'm going to make four to one. So in theory, I could lose at least three times on this trade and still profit if it does turn around. And I see guys do that. Like I know guys where they'll, you know, say you're making, I don't know, 500 bucks for or, or your, say your average winning trade is a thousand dollars just for argument's sake. Right. 
you know, they'll lose, they'll get in a trade, lose 200 bucks, get in a trade, lose, like same stock, lose 200 bucks, lose 200 bucks, lose 200 bucks, get back in and then they make a thousand, right? So they've made the money, but you have to hold through that whole downturn. You can't, you can't take your profits early because then the system doesn't work, right? It's a very, it's a very mathematical way of trading and it's all about playing the odds like really, really strictly. So you got to be kind of like a bit of a sociopath to do that <laughs> in my, my perspective, but um but uh yeah so like that's that's just kind of i just kind of wanted to go over that just to give you guys a few different examples of of how you could trade the same setup so that's that's where i'm at right now in my trading career is that i have a system which is you know pretty similar to this like i i could you know i could look at this candle and obviously when i see it starting to come up i know that basically from this 250 up to 350 like that's the scale zone because sometimes it only gets to here and then it tanks sometimes it gets up to the top of that wick and then it tanks. Sometimes you get what we have here, which is best case scenario where it goes over that wick. And then what this is, is everybody, you know, it tanks on this day and then it creeps up, creeps up, it creeps up. And then it breaks over this high. And then everyone's like, oh, sweet. This thing's going, you know, it's broken over this high. It's new highs. It's great. It's going to go to a hundred dollars a share. And then you zoom out and you say, no, it's not. Look at how many people are still stuck. It's not going to a hundred dollars a share. So, so this is basically just a quick, you know, rip up where it's basically stopping out it's, it's a combo move, right? Like you're stopping out all the people that were short risking over this high, which is a rookie mistake in my opinion, if you're a short seller. And it's also trapping everybody who's long, like all the people that are like, oh, this thing's gonna go to hundred bucks a share. They're all buying in here. And then you get that big stuff move down. So now you have no shorts, like no, you know, you have no smart shorts anyways. You've blown out all the shorts and you've just trapped a whole bunch of people long, which is best case scenario. Cause if there's not many people shorting, and there's a whole bunch of people that are stuck long, those are the ones where you're gonna get the best phase. So that's kind of why this, that's you know just a little bit of psychology on why this move happened. Um, but that's that's essentially just what I'm working through now. And I know like David, you're kind of more like the one in one out sort of thing. And I've done them both ways. I mean, I still trade, like depending on what I see, I have setups where I trade them all in, all out. And I have most of my setups are like this though, where I'll scale a range and then scale back out. But it's just, the profits just aren't quite as big if you're scaling in and out and it's a lot more involved. So you gotta like, it's just, it's just a tricky process, but it depends on what your personality do. Right? Uh, I think it's, it's part of adapting because we had a long conversation about this, I think last week and like, and, and what I discovered was like my trading style works because it's, it is swing trading. Like I couldn't, like I would have to be, I would force be forced to size in and size out if I was doing what you were doing. Like the reason um, I can one in and one out is because like, cause I'm swing trading. I have like days and weeks, maybe even months to like kind of look at the graph and get a second look and get a third look and make a decision and it's still never too late. And then the other thing is because I'm swing trading, you know, the stocks aren't moving that much over the day, over days and weeks, but over a month they might move quite a bit. And so like, I have to capture that whole move. Otherwise I'm not really making much profit. So like my, my goal for each, each um, swing is about 30 to 40%. Um, and you, and, and that's like really aggressive, even for something that's like a month, a few months long, six months long swing, but like, those are the, what I'm aiming for though. And then, and then, yeah, you kind of have to like try to capture the, the, the very bottom and capture the very top and in order to get that, get that, get that percentage. Yeah. But that, that's still, that works really well for you, obviously, though, like, obviously, you know, you're pretty successful at doing that. And I think that that kind of goes back to what I was saying originally is where, if you're going to take those trades, you know, you don't trade that often necessarily, but when your orders do get hit, you're like, you pretty much know that when one of your orders get hit, you're going to make a pretty good amount of money. Yeah. Right. So, whereas again, you know, if, if you're doing the scaling thing, probably trading more often and making less money in each individual trade, and you're probably going to lose more often too, realistically, but you're going to lose small. Yeah. hundred percent. Um, yeah, I, I, I think lately I've just done kinda, like maybe one trade a month. Yeah, yeah, right. But like, I mean, most of your tra trades work out. <laughs> they work out. Oh, but do you know what? I th You mentioned something with your trade that was like, um, you, how like you might get, you don't want to get stuck in a position, so you stop out. Remember, we, we always talk about how I don't set up stops. <laughs> like <Yeah>. what? what <laughs> one of the things, like the reason is because like I, generally only trade stock companies that I already own as an investment. 
And so, like, if I continue to own it, it's not like I'm like, who cares? Like, I just I'll ride this one out. Right. So, like, so like that that's kind of like what I did to mitigate that factor. Like, I only trade stocks I basically already invest in. I yeah, figure I'm doing the second. research anyway because I know the stock really well. Right. Yeah. See, I can't do that as like a short <laughs> seller because I could just get like completely murdered. Like, uh, I'll show you. I'll show you guys this quick, Sam. If you want to pull up my screen one more time, I got. I got to pull this one up. I gotta say though, I I've never seen you get anxiety or rattled like doing your day trades, but then you do when you're holding investments. <laughs> like when oh. you're holding something for like a period of time, it's been up a little bit. You're just like, all right, I'm gonna go get out. <laughs> oh, I know, I hate it. But yeah, I gotta, I, I just gotta show you guys this, just as a as a friendly reminder. David's laughing because you know this. I think we <laughs> we knew a guy who lost over a million dollars on this trade. <laughs> <laughs> but uh but uh yeah this this is what can happen if you're not careful right like i mean you know like david from your perspective you're saying you know if i'm if i'm buying a stock it's already something i own right so like if you're if you're trying to dip by tesla i mean you're invested in tesla so if you if you have to hold it then it's like oh, okay well i'm not going to sell it a loss i'll just hold it for a year and then i'll be <laughs> break even again but you know in this okay. case if you look at a company like you know like yeah. Newegg, for example, this was a pretty iconic move over the last, like about a year ago or whatever it was. Um, you know, this company's garbage. Like, I know it's garbage. I know it's going to, you know, just keep trickling off to nothing. But at the end of the day, I mean, if I had a shorted it here at 10 bucks and I was like, oh, this thing's a piece of crap, you know, it's it's not worth anything. Well, that's true. But I don't going to be able to survive being down 800% on my position at the very top here. <laughs> so... That's usually what happens is you know, people, get, people get blown out on this. And then, you know, and then obviously this is what we expect, right? And, you know, it's gone from 80 bucks all the way down to four bucks. So any fun, that's what I always say, you know, like I'd rather, I'd rather be right than make money. I mean, you're right if you short it here, technically, because the stock is not worth $10 a share, but price action always reigns supreme. It's kind of, you know, because like I, have an, I was talking to my one friend about this the other day. Like I have an engineering background. That's what I went to school for. Like that's kind of like what I do as a profession. And like one of the, one of the, one of the things they teach you in engineering is that the draw, like the site drawings, the, the construction drawings always take precedence over the written documents. So for example, if you have like, if you have a site drawing, let's just say you're, you're running electrical, you're running a sewer line, you're, you know, installing a road or whatever, like, say you're doing a road on, like on the drawings if it says you know we're doing 75 mils of base asphalt and we're doing 50 mils of top asphalt that's what it says on the drawing but then you look in the written you know the 100 odd page written document for the tender and it says you know say 60 mils base and you know 50 mil top you quote on what the drawing says you always quote on what the drawing says because that's what everybody works off everybody always works off the drawings right so it's the same kind of situation here, whereas like if you ever get in that discrepancy, even at the fuel pumps, you know, where they where they say like if there's a discrepancy like between the fuel pump and the cash register inside, we'll always take the fuel pump as what what's accurate. You ever seen those little notes on them? Seems familiar now. Yeah. So like so it's the same kind of thing, right? It's like like to me, the way that I always look at it is like fundamentally, if there's a discrepancy between what's happening in the fundamentals versus what the stock chart is telling me. I always just listen to the stock chart because that's the price action. That's what people are actually doing. That's where the money is going. So that's just kind of a little tip for you guys is even as the market's crashing, I know we've kind of been talking a lot, you know, in our last episode, so we're not going to get into it again, but um, we do the same thing. I mean, we, we look at the economy, we look at the fundamentals and, you know, they're not necessarily agreeing right now compared to what the charts are saying, but the chart is the price action. That's what's showing you the buying and the selling. So if the chart is telling you something that's not necessarily lining up with what the economy is telling you, in my opinion, I always listen to the chart because that's that's what's actually happening. That's not what should be happening. Yeah, you see, you see, you see people who like can't admit that they're wrong, and then they'll say stuff like, "Oh, there's them start making excuses." Oh, like um, it's manipulation. Like the famous one for the last few years was manipulation. And there's always like an excuse. It's like, no, the, the, the excuse really is like, even if you're right on the fundamental side, if everybody else doesn't know it, then it's not going to be reflected in the prices at all. Manipulation just drives me nuts too, because whenever someone says manipulation, it's only when they're losing. It's like, <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Stock, was manipulated and it caused you to make, you know, $200,000. Are you going to be upset because it was manipulated up and it made you a bunch of money? No. Yeah. So like it, the manipulation is always there. Just learn how to work with it, man. Every stock is manipulated. It's it's part of the game.
how many people were bitching when Elon Musk, uh, what's it? He launched Doge from like I don't know what to, to to like what levels. Like how many X they've made? Not one peep yeah. from the manipulation or whatever. Suddenly he no. supposedly tanks the price, and suddenly he's like, "You've ruined my life." <laughs> it's like, yeah, it's just yeah, it's just stupid. So, but anyways, I think we could probably wrap it up there for today. Cool. What do you think? Sounds good. All right. All right. Sweet. Well, thanks for tuning in, guys. We'll be back again next week. Later. See ya.